This video is going to go over lesson one, Traits for Survival. So the introduction page has our vocabulary words here. So starvation, dehydration, suffocation, predation, physical trait, criteria, constraints, behavioral trait, and species. Remember that if you click on vocabulary cards, it will take you to the flashcards that help you quiz yourself. And so once the slows, the vocabulary term will show up. You can flip the card to see if you understood the definition and then go to the next word, et cetera. And so if we keep going, right, the introduction talks about how an animal can survive despite the threats present in its environment. And so one important detail here is the fact that even though this jaguar has whiskers that help detect um, its environment and it has sharp teeth and sharp claws, that these traits don't really guarantee that the jaguar will survive in its environment. However, they do help increase the chance that the jaguar will survive. And so again, this lesson talks about the cells and uh, heredity, exploring um, the traits of living things. So again, heredity is talking about how traits are passed down from one generation to another. We'll learn about what organisms need to survive, the traits that help organisms get what they need in order to survive and avoid threats along the way, and learn how traits can be passed down from parent to offspring, right? So you and I are offspring of our parents and um, puppies are offspring of dogs, kittens are offspring of cats, et cetera. You can also have offspring of plants as well. Right, so trees can produce seedlings, which are offspring of the trees, flowers, same thing. We also mentioned that traits can be an inspiration for engineers who design products. And so I mentioned at this point that we talked about biomimicry. And so biomimicry is this idea that engineers can design things in real life, say for example, planes that are based off of birds, right? Birds are very aerodynamic, they're efficient in how they travel. And so people have designed planes after their structure. Same goes for the inside of a shell. Right? So people have designed spiral staircases after things that they find in nature. Finally, we'll link causes to effects as we think about how environmental factors influence some traits. I'm going to move on to section one and highlight things that we should be aware of. Right? So section one talks about organism survival. And remember that when you click on the play button, right, you have the option to have the computer play the text for you. When you click on the star, it'll highlight main ideas. Of course, you can highlight things, right, and unhighlight things. And so section one, organism survival. So this is split up into two subsections, needs for survival and threats to survival. Right. And so animals and plants, they have different needs in order to survive. And so in general, they acquire their needs from their environment by right? all organisms. And as we learned, an organism is just a living thing, right? Whether that's a plant or animal. Many types of organisms, including animals, right, need food, of course, right? Food provides for us the nutrients and and the energy that we need to survive. And so this is in the form of sugars, fats, proteins, and minerals. Uh, without food, an animal might starve, right? So that would be called starvation, which is basically suffering or dying from lack of food. And that therefore is a serious threat to an animal's survival. 
Animals also need water and oxygen to function, right? So uh, they get water either from drinking it or by, drink, by eating food that contains water, right? Different types of food that contain water, right? It could range from a watermelon or other vegetables like celery and even uh, poultry, right? So chicken, um, chickens, they also consume some water. And so because they consume some water and some people eat chicken, they'll consume a little bit of water through the chicken as well. So structures such as lungs, right, which we have, or gills, which fish have, uh, take in oxygen from the environment. Animals can die if they don't take in enough water or oxygen to meet their needs. An abnormal or excessive loss of water, right, too much, losing too much water from the body can result in dehydration, right? And so a drought or lack of rainfall over a long period of time, which is kind of what happens, um, what's been happening in California recently, cause, might cause dehydration for organisms, right? Plants and animals. Suffocation is to suffer or die from lack of oxygen. Plants too have needs for survival, right? They don't have to eat food because they kind of make their own. Unless you're talking about a carnivorous plant like the Venus flytrap and other carnivorous plants, in general, plants make their own food through this process called photosynthesis. Many kinds of plants and animals, they have, um, sorry, many kinds of plants, they have parts called roots that take in nutrients from the soil, right, in order to, to get what they need. They also, plants also need sunlight, carbon dioxide, and um, space to grow, right, in the air. There are a lot of gases in the air, right? We take in the oxygen from the air and we exhale carbon dioxide. Plants, typically, they need carbon dioxide and they release oxygen as a waste product. Leaves of plants collect light from the sun. They take in carbon dioxide from the air that surrounds the plant. As far as threats to survival, organisms have to avoid dangers in their environment to survive. So an organism's survival is dependent not only on its ability to meet its needs, but also its ability to survive environmental threats. Right, so it's one thing to have a way to get food, water, oxygen, and space to grow, but it's another thing to be able to survive any sort of threats in the environment. So an organism, plant and animal, right, plants and animals, they need both. And so here we're talking about, you know, the kinds of threats that an organism can face in order for them to survive. And so the survival of organisms can be threatened by the danger of being eaten by other organisms. And when you're talking about the relationship between two organisms in which one captures and feeds on the other, this is called predation, right? You're familiar with the predator and prey relationship, right? Predators typically will eat prey. A jaguar might eat a deer. And so one thing to note here is that if there aren't enough prey, then the predators will starve. On the other hand, if you have too much predation, it will decrease the number of prey. And sometimes this will cause that prey to become extinct. Organisms can also be threatened by extreme temperatures, right? We can't really survive in areas that are too hot or too cold, unless uh, you're an organism that's called an extremophile. And those guys, they are organisms that are able to withstand extreme heat or extreme cold, extremely cold temperatures. But in general, right, animals need shelter or body coverings for protection against this threat. And so here we have uh, birds, right? For example, birds, they build a nest, which will keep the eggs warm and the chicks warm before these chicks are able to grow their feathers, right? That also will help keep them warm and avoid getting too cold in the, the environment. Another threat to an organism's survival is the risk of diseases, right? All organisms can get some kind of disease, whether it's a bacterial infection or a viral infection, right, from a virus. Diseases can weaken an organism and make it difficult for them to be able to meet their needs. And so organisms that are already dehydrated or starving have a higher risk of getting disease because their bodies aren't functioning normally, right? So, 
say for example, if a bacteria, if bacteria invaded an organism's body, a healthy organism can pretty much fight off the invaders. But if that organism is already struggling to survive, it might not be able to fight off those invaders because the body's already trying to deal with something else, right? We can think about this in, in humans too, right? If um, there are folks who have high blood pressure, uh, maybe diabetes or are obese, right? If they are uh, already dealing with one condition and they get sick, it will be more difficult for them to survive uh, an infection. And so here we have a leopard that needs food to survive. It's going to hunt and kill other animals, right? Like, like this deer in order to meet its need for food. And for this deer, predation is one of the factors that will threaten its survival. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to uh, section two. This we should have completed in class. So section two talks about physical traits and survival. Right, and so here every organism it has many physical traits that help meet its needs or help it survive threats to its survival. You have shells and scales that are examples of physical traits that help an organism survive. When we're talking about physical traits, we're talking about a distinct, a specific feature of um, uh, an organism, right? A specific feature of their body. And so some physical traits protect against organisms, protect against predators. Other physical traits help organisms avoid dehydration, starvation, or even extreme temperatures. So when we're talking about protection from predators, many animals use physical traits to protect against predators. And some animals will have sharp teeth, claws, and hooves that they can use if they're ever attacked. A lot of animals will hide from predators by using camouflage, right? This right here is not quite a, a leaf. It looks like a leaf, but it's actually uh, an insect, right? That has a physical trait that helps it hide from predators. And so this is how they blend in with their surrounding, right? Camouflage. Uh, this catadid, right? Again, it's an insect that has wings that mimic a leaf. And so this, because of its camouflaging ability, the predators typically can't really differentiate, can't really tell the difference between the insect and the plant um, that they're looking at, right? Octopuses or octopi have a different method of camouflage. They have this pigment containing structure in their skin that causes the skin color to change so that it matches the octopus's uh, background which is really cool. I recommend finding a video on this. The way they change colors is really fascinating. So plants too have physical traits that protect them from predators. If you ever have tried to touch a cactus plant, you may have been pricked by its spines. Many kinds of plants produce spines or prickles or thorns along their branches and stems such as roses, cactuses or cacti and honey locust trees are examples of these types of plants. And so these sharp structures help them survive because if an animal tried to eat them, they'd get a mouth full of thorns, right? Some insects are blocked from eating uh, fuzziness, right? Fuzzy leaves because they, they can't reach the leaf through the thick fuzz. And sometimes some of these fuzzy hairs release chemicals that even sting the predator. Protection from dehydration. Some animals, right, and plants, they have physical traits that help them meet their needs for water and protect against dehydration. So for example, cacti, right, the plural of cactus, they have physical traits that help them survive. Their thick stems store large amounts of water that plants can use when conditions are dry. Animals also have physical traits uh, that help them save water. Camels right, drink huge amounts of water in a very short time when it's available so that they can actually retain or keep the water in blood so they don't need to drink as often as other animals, right? This will help them survive in very warm conditions in deserts. 
they also, organisms, have protection from starvation. Organisms have physical traits that help them get food or protect them from starvation. A long, narrow beak will help a woodpecker, right? A uh, bird get a meal out of a small hole in a tree better than a bird that has a broad beak. Like the cactus stores water, some plants store excess food to help prevent starvation. So for example, beets, carrots, potatoes, they store food in their roots. The humps on a camel's back are also physical traits that protect against starvation, right? A camel stores fat in its humps, and this fat can be broken down into energy and nutrients when it's difficult, when it's hard to find food. And protection from extreme temperatures, right? If you have animals with fur, skin, feathers, and fat layers, these are all examples of physical traits that protect an animal against extreme heat or extreme cold. So here's the camel. We'll move on to section three. The science key concept here before section three is talking about physical traits for survival, right? And how all these organisms have physical traits. I'll leave it to you to watch this video. And so section three is about how traits inspire design, right? Humans have physical traits that, that make them well suited to warmer environments. Humans are less suited to survive where it's cold because we don't really have fur or thick feathers or blubber that other animals have to keep warm. And so people over time have relied on clothing, different types of clothing to keep us warm, such as uh, jackets filled with down feathers, right? These are feathers typically from geese, right? They are light and fluffy, found on birds like ducks and geese criteria and constraints. And so I wanna take a moment to talk about what criteria and constraints are. And so there are jackets, right, that are very light and easy to pack in a small space. Um, again, these are down filled jackets, right, with a jacket filled with down feathers. Uh, in the 1980s, the US Army began looking for materials to use in jackets that could benefit soldiers right to keep them warm when they're wet right even if they're swimming in cold water for up to 10 minutes so they needed material that had to be water resistant and were able to dry quickly these requirements for the army's specific criteria right criteria are requirements for a successful design and so it was important though that the army uh, not spend too much money. It couldn't be too expensive to be able to clothe the soldiers. And so this, this cost restriction was a constraint, right? A constraint is just a limitation to an engineering solution. I want you to make sure you understand the difference between criteria and constraint. One is talking about what you need, the requirements. The other one is talking about limitations. And so people had to figure out how to design a solution, right? Designing solutions. And so a company designed an artificial version of down feathers and it was made to have a similar structure as down feathers. It was almost as warm as down feathers when it was dry, but it was better than down uh, feathers at keeping someone warm when wet, right? It, it satisfied the constraints because it was cheaper to make. And the material was so successful that it's now used in jackets sold to the general public. And so scientists also revise, as in they edit, they look at, again, criteria and constraints. The creation of this down alternative solved another problem that the army was trying to fix. It created a method or a way for making jackets that didn't require raising geese, right? Because in order to get down feathers, you had to raise geese or ducks, right? If you're making it artificially, you don't need to worry about that cost and that time. And so 
the criteria and constraints for every problem are generally chosen based on human needs, the natural resources available, the costs involved in designing the solution, and societal values, right? Anything that society thinks is valuable. Section four talks about behavioral traits and survival. And so behaving in a certain way can help an animal survive um, any sort of threat in its environment by helping it avoid danger. A behavioral trait is the specific or the distinct way an organism interacts with its environment. So for example, right, some lizards will run to the tops of trees or treetops when they sense a predator on the ground. Other animals, right, they pretend to be dead, right, reptiles, when they're faced with a predator, right? And so this is called apparent death when they pretend to play dead so that the prey eventually can escape when the predator looks away and goes, ah, that one's already dead. And so other animals, right, this puffer fish, Right, the one on the right has collected water into its belly so that it looks larger and its spine stick out when there's a threat around it, right? It will help this pepper fish survive when other fish are around. Section five talks about environmental influences on traits. A lot of, uh, there are lots of cause and effect relationships between the environment and traits. The environment can influence an organism's traits even when the organism isn't threatened. So for example, rainbow trout right, are born in freshwater streams or lakes, but some migrate and spend most of their life in the ocean. Although they are the same species, right? the rainbow trout uh, that move to the ocean end up looking different from the rainbow trout that stay in the lakes or rivers. Just a note here, a species is a group of living things that share traits and that can breed successfully with each other. So in other words, right, these are organisms that can make offspring who themselves can make other offspring. Right, let me see if I can type that up for you here, right? So a species, It refers to a group of organisms who can make fertile offspring, meaning that the offspring can themselves make offspring, right? And so a counter example to this are um, a horse, and a donkey, right? They make a mule. Mules don't count as a species because they, oops, because they are infertile, right? They can't, they can't make baby mules. So let me know if you have any questions about that. And so here we find that after a few years, the rainbow trout that moves to the ocean are larger than the rainbow trout that live mostly in rivers. And so what we'll find, right, is that the physical traits of an organism change based on their environment. Plant traits are influenced by their environment too. If you have two plants of the same species growing in different environments, they might end up with traits that are so different as they grow. One plant might be larger because it had more sunshine, water, or both. And if the larger plant received more sunlight or water, there would be more than one cause, right? That resulted in the larger plant. There are also environmental factors that help uh, enhance the survival of an organism, right? So if the soil is rich in nutrients, usually plants grow taller, have more flowers and are healthier. And so I want you to imagine 
right? An example where you have two of the same type of plants, you have one that has soil with fertilizer, one has soil without fertilizer, everything else equal, the same amount of water, the same amount of light, the same type of plant, the same space to grow, right? Here we can tell that it's because of the fertilizer that this plant actually grew. I'm going to go on to section six, passing on traits to offspring. So we have a lot of physical traits that are passed on from parents to offspring, right? So think about this mother brown bear and her cubs. They both have thick fur, right? And each bear has a hump on its shoulders, right? And so that is a physical trait that helps them survive. So it's passed on from one generation to the next. Even behavioral traits can be passed on to offspring, right? So spiders who spin webs with unique designs, right? That is a behavioral trait that is passed down. Other behavioral traits are passed down when the offspring learns the behaviors from the parent. Right, and so say for example, the mother bear here teaches the cubs how to fish. That's a behavioral trait that they learn through experience, right? Only organisms which survive long enough reproduce, long enough to reproduce will pass on their traits to their offspring, right? That makes sense. You can't pass on your traits to your offspring if you're not gonna be able to survive, right? In order to make the offspring. And so the final section here, the summary, just make sure that you are aware of the key ideas from each of the sections, okay? And that concludes this video.